Yeah. I just had this a few minutes ago that I'm amazed with how many people are here. I thought that the Thursday morning session would be very well attended, so I appreciate you guys coming. Um, I'm really excited both about this topic and to present with Paul. Um, as I talked with Paul, I just appreciated his, his knowledge and his feelings about this decoupling. Uh, in fact, let's do an introduction. Um, I'll talk a little bit about myself, then to get a chance. I'll do my next one. Okay. <laughs> Paul's great. You'll hear even more about that later. Um, my name's Sean Walpole. For those of you that saw the, <laughs> you, you might be hearing this for the third time, but one of the things about me is I can laugh at the same joke over and over again. It's marvelous. I can collect joke books and they never get old. Um, I've been programming LabVIEW since 2000. When, uh, when I worked for National Instruments, that was a lot of fun. I think National Instruments is an awesome company and we're so happy to partner with them. I worked for Indigit. Uh, we're a consulting company, that uh, an alliance partner. It's based out of Utah. I have cards up here. Please, please let me know if you have any questions. And go to the next fact site. Uh, Perfect. And I'm super excited to present on decoupling uh, UI. I realized as we were preparing this that there's not a toolkit you can download that decouples the UI for you. It's, it's kind of more of a, a thing that's important while coding, and you kind of have to figure out your own style and how to do it. But I, I look out at, in this group, I want to get a, um, kind of a feeling for what you all hope to get out of this presentation. So if I were to ask, how many of you are already decoupling your UI? Excellent, okay. How many don't know why this is even be important or more just curious about it? Okay, and yeah, and how many have some great ideas for us all to share of this is what really works in my application? Wow, okay, a few. Um, and part, the, the outline here, what I'll really like to do is, uh, I'll get on my soapbox for a minute. What, what I've seen is applications, I think of a, a simple DAC example. I've, I've been stuck on this, but I think of a uh, DAC read going into a waveform chart. And how simple that is. You look at it and you're like, that's simple. Well, it's, it's simple, but it wasn't necessarily easy to do that because if you think of the chart, the chart has a history, it has multiple axes, it has plot styles, it has auto scaling, there's a lot of features in there. The same thing with that, it's got calibration, all these features, and they've kind of separated it out. So as I think about decoupling UI, I think that what you have to do is figure out where those boundaries in the code are, and you can separate and you can have your DAC have all the DAC stuff, you can have your chart have all the chart stuff, and when you use them together, it just looks easy and, and pretty. And I don't know all the ways of, of doing that, but that's the goal. What I hope to do is talk briefly about why easy makes it so good to the code and how you decouple. Do that as fast as possible. Then I'm gonna give the time to Paul, and he's gonna show you a real world example of the thing that happens a lot in applications where you have a user interface element that you want to reuse in multiple places. And how can you effectively reuse that in multiple places without copying lots of code and without making the calling code look complicated? So that's going to be an excellent part. And then I'm hoping that even after doing that, we'll have some time and where we can have a discussion of, yeah, how do we do this more effectively? How can we actually make that? In, in my mind, the answer to the question is, how can we get to that DAC read and chart? simplicity, where you can just look at your code and say, yeah, here's where we're starting the test, here's where it finishes and publishes results, and, and how to do that. Um, okay, um, we can give this slide, this is just saying that you're not going to come to this presentation and me say, this is how you should be doing it, and you'll be like, okay, now I'm doing it his way and everything's good. You've got to find your own style, what works, and I, I, I'm a believer in one size doesn't fit all. Figure out how you can make your code decoupled easier. Um, okay, we're going to 
cruise through these. This was almost more of a thought exercise because I was talking to a coworker who's who's very diligent, and I was like, "Yeah, you just decouple your code." And we started thinking, "Well, what kinds of decoupling are there?" And together we sat down and realized there's a bunch of ways decoupling, or a bunch of ways code can be coupled. Um, so. This was what got me started on this topic. This was code I wrote not too long ago, and <laughs> I didn't intend for it to be messy. I mean, this is me as a CLA having written code before, and I was writing a test, and as I was writing the test, I was updating my, my UI, so you can see that here's part of the test. We're doing a read here. You know, here's part of checking to see if it passed failed, and then something I have to update the user interface, and update the user interface, and, and when I was looking at this, I was like, man, what made this code complicated? I tried to keep it simple, and, and in my mind, when, I mean, I guess we could, could have separated the business logic pass scale calculation. That probably should be a sub BI and figure out how to make that better. But a lot of the complexity just came because as I run the test, I was also updating the user interface. Just seem like that's how you do it. That's that's what's happening. But I, and I started once this happened. I started to notice this happens a lot in my code. <coughs> when I'm updating user interface and doing the other stuff, it's it's all in one. <coughs> um, so then the started talking about well, what about file coupling? What about you know? Could you say here's my user interface code on disk, and when I check it in, I can see yeah, I didn't check change business logic because that's in a different spot. Um, the dependency coupling, this is, this is an interesting one, but this is another soapbox item for me where I hate dependency item, dependency linking. I hate when module A uses module B, which then uses module A. That, I mean, you can kind of tell when you get that, because if you load module A and look in the dependencies, it's like, module B is there. Oh, and so is C and D, and you know, I, I really hate this codependency, and, and I notice that that's easy to do with uh, user interface stuff. If you're not careful, you can have your user interface that depends on your driver, which is probably okay if there's a one-way dependency. But if you're not careful, and your driver then depends on something that's in your user interface, you've got kind of this locked <coughs> kind of thing where you can't just load one that always <coughs> um, this is one that I liked. I used to do uh, user interfaces with system controls and put them together, and I'll pat myself on the back and like, yeah, I'm, I'm a great all-around programmer. Well, then I started to meet some people that actually did user interface that looked good. <laughs> In fact, I have a demo today to prove to y'all that I don't do user interfaces good, so <laughs> when we get to that. But if, if you can separate the two, you can have someone who's got a user interface mindset do it. And, a few stupid examples, but um, I pulled up this screenshot of Mac OS because it's got a great UI, but it's based on um, Unix. So you know, it's, there, there's a separation where the core of what they need that had certain features and user interface they had is <coughs> very different. I also love the example of a microwave. I think a microwave has power level, it has time, it has popcorn setting, and all these things. But my favorite microwaves that I've used have this big idiot button where you go up and you turn it and it starts cooking. Man, that's, that's beautifully simple. And it's a very different design of the interface than it is <coughs> of what the microwave can do. Um, this is kind of linked to the other, the, the design coupling. I guess if you're a smart and capable person, you could separate the two in your head. But decoupling the user interface also has the advantage that it doesn't have to be one person. Um, you can have someone who's uh, good at UI, take parts of your project and, and fix the UI without breaking the other stuff. Um, timing was one interesting one that's, this is kind of a litmus test that's, uh, if you have UI and your driver in the same loop, you have some interesting things where, well, I can't slow down the UI updates because that loop has to execute at this rate because that's the <coughs> hardware stuff. So it's this kind of uh, interesting tie-in. Okay, and I've already got on my, my soapbox. But the example that I described earlier, this to me is, is almost the goal. It's you replace that DAC VI with 
a VI driver that works with your project that might be talking to multiple attacks, might be talking to desktop instruments or bench top instruments. Who knows what it's doing, but it still looks simple from your, your code. And likewise, as we'll see later, if you have a user interface element, it's self-contained, it does what it needs to do, and, and it works. Um, with that, I'm going to change computers and do a brief, simple, I mean, it, I, I think a lot of our code complexity comes from project complexity. It's really hard to do a complex project in a, a simple way. So unfortunately, I'm not going to show a complex project in a simple way. I'm going to show a really simple project in a simple way. <laughs> and, and some of you may have seen this, so I won't, yeah, I won't spend too much time at it other than to say um, I'll run an example um, on the left, uh, a pattern that I, uh, I'll start out saying what this is, is a, a, a pretty stupid control loop that's trying to bring this room temperature up to this set point using analog output commands here. And of course I've got PID and arrange my output and use my set point. Uh, what is, is I, what I like about this example is Here's where the graph's getting updated. And you can see that update. And I think you can look at it and say, yeah, we're, we're running at some rate. 10 times a second is our update rate. This is not the PID control loop. So the PID might be running at a different um, different rate. And that, that is one point that, I don't, that I'm not going to discuss, but that's kind of hard, is getting that line cut is hard. I've made the choice here that UI is just going to update at its own rate, but that does mean that if PID is running faster, there's points that aren't going to be on the UI. And if it's running slower, you're going to get the same PID calculation multiple times. And in, in this case, for simplicity, it was a worthwhile trade-off just to keep it simple. But that is <coughs> the problem with decoupling is how do you make that clean? <coughs> and I won't go into more. Uh, the, the, where the PID is happening is, is in a, a spawn loop in this case. But this is just a a silly example of, or not silly, but uh, it's an example of what I want out of my code. I want it simple, but I also want this, in this case, to be the user interface. And I know that I could change it without affecting the business logic. Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to Paul, and hopefully we're, we're good on time where we can go in detail on Paul's, and then I hope to have a good discussion where we can actually say, what other ways have we um, to share or to decouple the user interface. Okay, good morning. Um, Sean warned me he'd go to that quite quickly. I thought I had another few minutes to wake up. Apparently not. Um, so Sean's given us a really good introduction to, to some of the types of coupling we might see uh, and talk about some of the reasons we might want to avoid it. Um, and what I'm going to do, uh, I don't know why I did that. Um, is show an example of an application that we've written for a customer um, and where we are doing some of these things to be able uh, how you work in our business or do. Hopefully showing you some of the real advantages that we've gained from doing that. Um, I will say it is a, a way of doing this, not the way. There are plenty of different ways and different techniques you can use uh, at all sorts of different levels uh, to try and decouple where you are. So, I work for a company called Precision Acoustics. I didn't introduce myself. I'm Paul, Paul Morris from Precision Acoustics. Uh, I've been doing that for about 15 years now, but it's only in the last five or so, maybe even three or four, so I've really started to learn how to do it better. As a company, we specialize in making ultrasound measurement devices, from the sensors right through to big measurement systems. And what I'm going to show you in a minute uh, is a piece of code for doing some uh, data visualization from a non-destructive testing. So, quick introduction to non-destructive testing with ultrasound. We have an ultrasound probe, we fire a pulse of ultrasound into the material that we're testing, and we get reflections from the surfaces and anything inside the material. It gives us a time domain signal that we can apply uh, gating and thresholding to. And from that, we can get all sorts of uh, uh, maps of those values as we scan uh, our probe over whatever it is we're testing. So we might, for example, be looking to find a defect in the material, in which case we can just say, well, does our signal, so I should just explain a little bit more. Uh, which one's 
So the first uh, blip in the signal is the, the ultrasound reflecting from the front surface of the material. This might be something reflecting from inside the material, and then this is the rest of the energy that's gone to the back and then come back to the front. If the customer wants to know if there's a defect, they're basically looking for, does, is there a signal in here? And we can do that processing over a map of 2D data, and we might get uh, an image something like this on the right there. You might also be interested in how big that signal is, um, because it gives us a bit more information than the PS threshold of data. Uh, and also, well, this is a really boring version, uh, how deep uh, that defect is by time of flight measurement. So we had a customer who we delivered a system to a few years ago, um, and they asked us for some more features on the this data visualization. To start with, there's quite a few problems we have to solve here. They've got quite big data sets, so the scans are sort of 70 million points per, per data set. Each one of those, depending on how many of those thresholds they have, there's at least two data sets per gated region, and then one to kind of combine everything. I need to be able to maintain an aspect ratio. So they're scanning a real thing. They want to make sure that their images are uh, displayed uh, in the right shapes. So something that was square on their piece of material is going to be square on the screen. But they want to do that even though they may not have scanned their thing with the same increments in both axes of the scan. They want to be able to quickly switch between the different maps. They want to be able to change the color scale, make measurements, zoom, scroll around, uh, and then actually do sentencing, so where they'll do some pass-fail work, uh, having measured the things that they found on the screen. Uh, and their favorite one is they wanted to pop out display. I still don't know why. <laughs> so I'm going to do a quick demo now. Um, I'm going to show you the application. Um, and then what we'll do is uh, I'll talk about how we've done what we did with it. So, I'll just load some data. I can see it here. So, I've got some demo data um, from a real scan on a test piece. Um, we have to load it in and do some work in the background. But so, here's our main user interface. Um, it's actually written for a much bigger screen than this. But um, one of the advantages of the way we've done things is that this is reasonably scalable. So I can uh, potentially make things bigger. It hides stuff because it's for a bigger screen. So what you're seeing here at the moment on the bottom image uh, is a map of where there are defects, where there are things in the metal that they're scanning. Right in the center here is the actual test piece. The rest of this was just empty space. Uh, it was sat on top of something else in the tank. So the customer wants to be able to see things in, uh, in different uh, data types, so I can switch nice and easily between different uh, types of display, so either thickness or the amplitude of the signal. We can zoom into our data set, so I can zoom <coughs> in. I can see this image on the right, so I actually scroll that around and choose where I want to look. Uh, they want to be able to make measurements, so we can it's not very great color. So I can put measurements on and I've got that scale for the real size of the things on there. They want to be able to sentence their defects. So they want to be able to point at something and say, well, is that a defect? Let's have a closer look. So if I zoom a bit and I click on one of these. I can now pop up a new window showing just the defect that was selected. And I can change what is displayed for that defect, and I can measure it in this window as well. Um, we can also uh, do a, a region, so we can pull a region out and look at the different things in there. <coughs> so there's quite a lot going on in here, and it's, uh, just if I wanted to just give you a quick demo. So um, in the background, I need to be able to handle quite a lot of things in this application. I mentioned already that there's a lot of data. You can't display 70 million points in an intensity plot. There aren't that many pictures on the screen. So somehow I need in the background to be decimating that data so that I'm only displaying a suitable amount of data on the screen at any time. Uh, I need to be able to switch around and uh, I'm just doing got some nice uh, user interface features oh, and, and the customer's favorite. We can pop it out. <laughs> Like I say, I don't know why. 
Um, but you see that we actually managed to rescale the image as well. So we're always maintaining that real aspect ratio, even though I've changed the size of the screen. That's an intensity plot. No, this is all in an intensity plot. <coughs> So, how did we do some of this? That's the next question. Let's go back. <coughs> so, what we had to come up with was a way of having a nice modular user interface because we've got a lot of reuse. Um, and where we started was basically having a deployable DQMH module with an intensity plot on the front. Uh, and we're using MGI's panel toolkit as well to help load panels into the right places and put things in the right place. All of the interface, all of the logic for drawing this chart, all of the decimation and everything like that is happening inside that DQMH module. And because it's clonable, I can spin up as many copies as I need. So that's, that's the, the main way that we've done our decoupling here. Um, other advantages of doing it like this, so I've got a relatively simple user interface there, um, which means lab you can actually cope with scaling that to different sizes. It's only two or three controls, um, which means when I put it into a sub-panel, it's automatically going to resize and fit nice. So why did I choose to use these tools? Um, DQMH gives me an asynchronously running module that can handle all of these code. <coughs> Gives me event handling, and that's one of the key areas of decoupling. I think here is that we're, we've decoupled the event handling for interaction with that graph outside of my main application. It's all handled by the DQMA. Um, it also gives me the nice scripting tool to make some of the development a bit easier and quicker. Clonable is obviously a key thing here. All of those uh, C-scan images you saw in that uh, demonstration are—it's the same module just spun up as, as new instances of the same uh, DQMA module which means when I've implemented a feature like switching between the <coughs> data types, I can do that wherever I put that graph. Panel management, just a quick mention for the MGI panel toolkit. This is a really nice toolkit, um, which makes it really very easy to handle where panels are. Um, you, it's all uh, it's object oriented. It actually decouples and, and abstracts out the handling of the user of the panel location from the DQMH module. So there is a template for DQMHs based on the, uh, the MGI panel toolkit. Um, it's nice, it's extens extendable, which means in the future we could change the panel types nicely and that my DQMH module doesn't have to change because it's just written against the, uh, the panel class. Where is this toolkit? Uh, VI Package Manager and on MGI's website. Uh, it's the MGI panel manager. <coughs> So we'll have a little look at some of the code. Um, this is real code. This is not cleaned up nice code. <laughs> um, but uh, I'll just, just show you how some of this sort of fits together. <coughs> so here's my project in the background. Here's the, uh, the main front panel of that DQMH. So as I say, it's quite simple. It's got an intensity plot. Uh, there is one extra splitter here which allows me to show and hide this information at the bottom. So uh, as the user's uh, moving the mouse around, I can display the values from the data at that point. I didn't demo that because it's still running. Uh, show cursor data. So now you can see along the bottom there, I've got a live update of the position of the, of the mouse cursor and uh, the values in the data set. Uh, I've done some things slightly differently from a normal DQMH. One of the main differences is, whereas normally the DQMH you handle most things in the, me in the, the message handling loop does most of the work, because this is pretty much purely user interface, 90% of the stuff's going on in the event loop. Um, so all of my, uh, my handling is really done in the event loop, which means I've got quite a lot of different um, user events in there. But uh, let me just see what <coughs> We're talking about decoupling, um, and I think one of the things that is really helpful is to think about what modules are responsible for. So I've called this the C-Scan Display Module, but already there's actually interaction with that data. So one of the questions I start to ask myself is, should this module be handling the measurements that I do over the top, or should that be handled somewhere else? 
should I be decoupling some of the features of this module even further out uh, than I already have? And it turns out that I inadvertently <laughs> have. Um, because where I do use the message handling loop uh, is for some of the actual interactions. So you saw me select the, uh, some data on the graph or select an area on the graph. And that's actually handled in the message handling loop in, I think these are termed BRAC VIs, where I pass a reference to the control in, and then I can handle the interaction specific or the event specific to that selection in its own code, rather than being in the event handling loop of the DQMH view display. Um, in theory, that means I could actually pull this right away out of my module now, um, as long as I've got access to that event. <coughs> Although even then, I've actually brought, I rebroadcast most of the events for my main module anyway, so I don't even need the event uh, reference to the intensity. <coughs> but it's sort of evolved over time. Uh, what else do I want to show you? Any questions so far? What I think about what I'm doing? So you said that. In that, that you pass in reference to that block so it can manipulate it? Or? Yeah, it's, it's more so that it can register for the event, uh, although I have a feeling that I have changed that and it's just not used anymore. Uh -huh. So this is real code. Yeah, it, it used to register down here that, uh, for the maximum, <coughs> so I used to use it, but actually now I'm registering for broadcast from the main module. So the main module is handling. Uh, picking up all the, the events for mouse up, mouse down, mouse move on the graph and broadcasting that information out with some extra details on the data values at those points. So in my application, if, if I need a new interaction that's not done by the module, I can easily use my main application or some other module to do that if there's something that's a more specific task rather than the general ones that I try and handle in, in the module itself. So, yeah. Oh, um, I use my own. Oh. <laughs> so I've, I've actually got a slide about that in a minute. Um, Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, so the question was how do I um, look at the ROI tools, which I think is part of the IMAP toolkit. Isn't it? I, the answer is I don't. Um, oh, this is all done on an intensity plot. Some stuff we've written ourselves. Are you handling uh, state? Are you handling state in the event loop? State of what? State of. Uh, no, that's handled by the application, really. So the application uses the API for the DQMH to, to decide what it needs to do with that module. But the question was, am I handling state uh, in the event loop? I'm not entirely sure I answered the question, because I'm not entirely sure I understood. Uh, OK. So let's go back to the slides. So for me, I think this is one of the main benefits of this decoupling that we've done is the level of reuse. So I only had to write that one DQMH module. Uh, already I've got it in four different places and four different, slightly different contexts as well. Um, so that's, that's been a real key, uh, key benefit of using the DQMH and actually handling uh, this, this in the way we have. So I, I alluded to this earlier on. Is handling user interactions really the right thing to do in this module? I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Sometimes I think yes, because it's all about that C-scan display and things we want to do with it. But other times I do start to think that some of the interactions are a bit more specific and could come out and be <coughs> operational effectively rather than always being. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is just another level of decoupling, and this is going to the ROI thing, I think. So I needed to be able to draw on top of the, the intensity plot for the selection of areas, for the measurements. Uh, I'm using the plot image on the graph to do that. Well, I'm, I'm using a combination of plot image and in the annotation function. But I wanted to be able to do it uh, in, in, a, in a useful way. There's lots of different types of things I want to draw. Sometimes it's just a straight line with an arrow. Sometimes it's a box. Sometimes it's a box with a different color. Um, and I remember seeing a talk by Viva, who's at the front, uh, on some scalable user interfaces, so he was able to scale objects on the front panel. Is that the next slide? You presenting it again? Yeah. Where, where is that? This one. This one. Oh, okay. So stay here for a really useful talk on how to scale things. Um, and I'm not an OO expert by any stretch, and this composite pattern is what uh, 
we were presented on. And what we've actually got here is a, an overlay object at the top level, which knows how to draw an overlay and how to build an overlay. And then I create different child types of overlays. I've got an annotation, I've got a line, a rectangle, a single arrowhead. And I want to be able to put those together so that I can draw effectively anything I want to on the screen. So I create an overlay group class, which inherits from the overlay parent, but has an array of the overlay parent as its private data. And that means you get really powerful recursion. Uh, my DQMH module has in its module data one overlay group. I can add into it. I can take it all, things out of that group. I can turn things on and off. Um, and it's just through this. I mean, this looks quite complicated a lot of it now, but actually in code, it's really simple to do. And I, I was really impressed that I managed to do it. Um, but yeah, so I, I strongly recommend you go and see the talk on, on that. He'll give you a lot more detail on that. How are we doing for time? Yeah. I think that's pretty much the last slide I had. So, summary. Um, we've done some decoupling by creating UI element modules. So, it creates a module for a specific element of our UI. Um, using DPMH and MGI, but there's many different ways of doing it. I'm sure most of what I've done here could be done in other ways. I'm sure it can be done with that framework. If you want to go that way, I didn't. Um, is that? Yeah. So, uh, I should have done it differently, is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, and, and there's lots of different levels of decoupling. So hopefully we've kind of given you some thoughts on how to do this, some of the things to think about while we're doing it. Uh, and yeah, we'll open up to, to questions. Sean's got questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Yeah, thanks. We, we did try to finish with lots of time, and I think we succeeded, which is good. I wrote down a list of things that I thought, boy, we really should mention these as, as aspects of, of covering. But then I also thought, well, that, you guys might have questions with what we've already presented. So maybe what I'll do is uh, okay, we open it up for questions. If we get through the questions, I'd like to cover just some things that probably, well, maybe I'll even, maybe I'll, everybody already knows about these things. Who has dynamically registered for an event? This, this is a powerful tool for um, decoupling and being able to move an event handling code to a different sub VI so it can be shared. So if you don't know what that is, come see me after. We'll probably finish even the questions really so those that want to hear at stake, and I'll, I'll be up here and we can cover that. Um, one other thing I'll mention that I saw as I was researching for this that was kind of an interesting idea is the idea of a skin. Um, a lot of programming languages have a skin where you can change where controls are, you can change how they look, change the color. In, in LabVIEW, that would be modifying the, the front panel. You can do this without risking anybody breaking things by having a front panel that passes all of its references to somewhere else. That way the code for actually handling the controls is done somewhere else and the person changing the front panel can't break it. But they could have all the freedom they want to move the existing controls around, change their color, change their attributes, completely change things without risking breaking it. So I thought that was kind of an interesting idea if you wanted to separate the appearance and editing the appearance from actually changing the code and risking breaking something. Um, I think the... The, the, the last thing that I wrote down that I thought might be good to go in detail, but this is probably a huge discussion in itself, is when you start to separate the UI from the business logic and decouple that, you're going to have a loop that handles your UI, obviously. You're very likely going to have a loop that handles your business logic. How you communicate and tie those together is, is a, a big topic, and I only know of two ways two basic ways to do it. One is messaging between the two, and the other is using a shared resource between the two. And that gets into a, a lengthy discussion of going messaging versus references and how to do that. Um, so that we probably won't won't get into, but I'll mention, mention it. But with that, that was a, a lot of talking. I'm interested in hearing your guys' questions, discussion points. We'll uh, open it up. 
for probably 10 minutes. Hopefully we'll get 10, 10 15 minutes of good questions. Um, and after that, we'll, we'll officially end. But if you want to stay here, and we'll, I'll cover event registration and anything else, that would be great. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. How you would decouple with the school in several years? Okay. So the question is, how do you decouple the business logic and multiple GUIs? Excellent question. Um, there's there's multiple ways of doing it, but all of those ways share some common concepts. And, and one of the concepts is, if you're going to have multiple GUIs, you need to be able to instantiate it multiple times. So you're going to have to make a VI reentrant one way or another and possibly to dynamically launch it. Um, Actor Framework is great for this, uh, but DQMH Paul did it with, well. yeah, DQMH is, is good with it as well. Um, I kind of feel like it's, it's not actually that bad to do it just with the, the basic LabVIEW functions. Open VI reference with a strictly typed VI, and you can, uh, you can do that as well. Um, that, that's the mechanism for getting them there. Then you have to track them and insert them and having a way for each instantiated one to communicate with what it's responsible for. So that's a hand wavy answer. Is that like some patterns. Okay. Okay, yeah. yeah. Paul's saying I, I don't know, and I'm thinking I usually I usually follow a pattern that, that works well, but it's not a well defined one. It's to create a reference that's used in the loop, and then, well, the, the example that I showed earlier, that's the pattern I usually follow, follow, where you create a loop to handle the user interface, and then you create that in each of the spots where you want that user interface to be. Um, the, the academic pattern would be the model, model view controller, where you have your, your model that handles your data, the, in in lab view, it turns out to be like a model controller. So the model and the controller act together, and then the view is separate from it. So if you look up model view controller on Wikipedia, that's a good a good starting point. Yeah, it's the it's the academic part of how you yeah the design pattern on how to decouple stuff like that. We we should talk later. I want to think more about that because it's each case is so different. It's hard to just get the one example. But I think I could think of a better case. You mentioned that you opened the file, uh, and now you have that file, and there's different components that use it. How are you sharing that file? Is it a DVR? Yeah, so I put all my data in a DVR. Um, and I, I have multiple DVRs. I have one DVR that contains the raw data, and then when I load it into the viewing module, uh, I decimate the data and keep the various maps in their own DVRs as well. <coughs> yeah. yeah, so that's the nice thing. I have the one copy of the main data set. Because otherwise, we'll find out it's basically. Okay. So, I think what I can see here that you have to actually publish the UI from the business logic, but the part that is responsible for handling this uh, part of the UI, uh, you did not decouple the uh, way how the control works from how it is controlled. So, let's say, like right now, I would have a task to say, please change the rule of this control. Yeah. Uh, but another developer should work at the same time for just changing the details of how it is displayed. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the comment or question is that although we've decoupled the, the intensity plot module out from the business logic, it's still coupled to its own handling. Yeah. Um, so if someone wanted to change the way that that plot looked and someone else was working on the, the handling, then they're still coupled. I should be able to pass my reference to my type of intensity graph. Yeah, you can, yeah. Should work. yeah that's, that's definitely possible. It's something I've talked with Fabio <coughs> in the past is about yeah, having multiple different, effectively, front panels for a DQMH uh, by passing references around. Um, and I think you can do it by having, you can almost do it by having named controls. So if you said that the DQMH has, or our intensity plot has a particular name, then you could use something like uh, the traverse for reference point to the right front panel and then handle events in one place. Huh? It doesn't look like this one. I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did, you, did you try to adapt the 
how to adapt the screen to different screen resolutions. Because I notice, at least on my screen, I usually do just one size, and then yeah. sometimes you have to scroll, and sometimes. Yeah, so. For C++, they do this. Yeah, I mean, I think that's it's a fairly well-known limitation of LiveView is scaling screen sizes. Um, I'd say Veeam has got a great talk on how to do it really effectively. Um, if you can keep, so we keep the DQMH front panel quite simple, so there's only an intensity plot uh, and the control for the key, basically, an indicator for the color key. Um, LabVIEW can just about handle moving those things around and scaling them um, reasonably well. So, yeah, so that, that is quite adaptive. That normally runs on a, on a 27 inch monitor with much higher resolution. Um, it works fine and it also runs on my laptop, so it does scale quite nicely. Yeah, NXG scaling is really nice too, apparently. It says the NI guy. Well, <laughs> also, on the C++, they don't, um, they don't rescale it, don't let the lab view rescale it. They uh, read the screen resolution and then they just change the graphic yeah. according. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, people, I think I've seen people do that in that view, but it sounds like quite a lot of hard work. Yeah. Any other questions? How do you how do you access the overlay when you said you do it overlay? So I know how do you get how you access the overlay of the on the display model? Um, I'm not sure what you mean exactly. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so it's a lovely picture. Um, yeah, so that property node is property node from intensity graphs, and there's a thing called the plot image. And that's a, a lovely picture control that sits in front of your data. So you can do any picture manipulation lab you and just draw it over the top. And that's effectively what I'm doing through that class hierarchy. Uh, each one of those knows how to build a particular picture. I can show that if anyone's interested. I'll put that here. Yeah, so yeah. Um, I have a really ugly test. But it works. I don't know how well this will look on the screen. Sorry about this. So, uh, you can just about make out some green and red and black line at the top. So those are all, um, I don't remember what I've actually done in this case. I can hide things, so this is by having a label in my thing, I can turn different bits on and off. Um, if I show code, for example, <coughs> So I'm combining the annotation and the, so some things I'm using annotations and some things I'm using pictures. Uh, so if I look in here, I have a build overlay class and ultimately, so I do some calculations of the data for what I'm trying to draw, <coughs> convert that in this video to a picture. Uh, so it's just a lovely picture control. <coughs> and then my parent class is responsible for actually drawing them. It picks up the cursors through all of the objects in my group and does the draw at the end. So yeah, draw overlay just calls the build overlay, which is a group, which recurses through the more and just draw the part and add the annotation to it. Any other question? Discussion? Non decoupling question. Oh, how about no, did, sorry. <laughs> how much did you have to decimate your uh, data to make it uh, useful for the screen? It depends on the size of the data in the first place. There's lots of different data sizes. Um, how much did I have to do it? I basically make sure that I look at the, the size of the plot image, of the, of the size of the, the intensity plot in terms of pixels. And then I think I go to the stage of saying I don't want less than two pixels per data point per data set. So I make a new array yeah. and decimate it down to, it adapts to, to what to yeah, I assume that's just for screen preferences and sort of all the data. Yeah, yeah, we keep all of the data. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
discuss trade-offs of different architectures and how to actually do this. So, uh, But those that want to leave early and are done will end officially here so that you can uh, prep for your next session. So thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you very much.